Okay, good morning. Uh, happy to do the first breakout session uh, on individual circumstances uh, and life outcomes, thinking about the role of income education in place. Uh, so I'm the panel leader, Bradley Hardy from American University. Uh, we've got a, uh, a great panel here with uh, Erica Greenberg and Paul Ong. Um, I'm gonna start off giving you a bit of an overview of the session and thinking about some of the big issues and then I'll introduce our panelists. Um, kind of the overview is that I'll speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, they'll both speak about 10 minutes apiece. And then like uh, you know, we were talking about in the first session, the idea here is really open it up for uh, discussion back and forth. It's not really us talking to you all. It's really supposed to be a joint uh, dialogue. So that's the, the idea we're going for here. Um, but you know, from my view as a labor economist, uh, there's been great attention to thinking about the, the transmission of social and economic status across generations. Uh, and so, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is a big 2050 issue, but it's, it's, not, it's not new. Uh, just in my own field of economics, uh, you've had scholars uh, like Gary Salon, Sheldon Danziger, Tim Smeeting, Gary Becker, Greg Duncan, Raj Chetty, Bosch Mazumder, and that's just naming a few uh, that have conducted some seminal work in this area. And we know there's a strong link between family background and, and subsequent socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, and so in short, uh, educational capacity, um, educational uh, resources at the neighborhood level, parental income, wealth, race, uh, and neighborhood quality more generally has been strongly associated with these socioeconomic outcomes, uh, these so-called life outcomes that we're here to discuss today. Um, now, complicating matters, many of these factors are really difficult to separate out. Uh, some of the same children uh, that are growing up in, in economically disadvantaged families uh, are also trying to climb up this economic ladder, and they've got these weak rungs. Some of those weak rungs are um, uh, limited job opportunities for their parents, uh, limited school capacity, uh, and then it's kind of came up in the, in the last uh, uh, panel, uh, what if any access to networks uh, do these young people have? Social networks, job networks, um, you might even move people geographically into opportunity, but it's, it, it's not as clear that they have the, the access to networks that they're gonna need to, to strive. Uh, so with that said, uh, there is some good news. Thinking about 2050 and a lot of great papers put together to think about uh, evidence and forecasting where we're gonna be. Um, but I'm also kind of struck by what we know relative to 50 years ago. Um, and there were institutions, um, places like uh, uh, Institute for Research on Poverty, among others, that were really trying to do some of the seminal work on poverty and mobility work. We know quite a bit. We, we know that the safety net uh, by and large works to improve socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, we know using pretty rigorous causal identification methods uh, that school expenditures uh, do improve outcomes for the students. Uh, these were open questions. Uh, we know that neighborhood quality matters uh, positively. Early child education has positive benefits. And so our panelists are gonna speak to some of these issues as well. Um, but what I wanna do is, is put forth at least like three sources of tension. There, there's, there's multiple, and I got a, a great room in here. Um, but at least three sources of tension as we consider this role of income education in place. Um, Bill Fry talked about this a little bit. I think there's a general debate surrounding the relative importance of um, sort of individual and parental choices, um, how that compares to uh, structural, ecological, environmental factors as the ultimate drivers of life outcomes. And that's, that's a very real tension. And no use in, in pretending that's not there. Um, I think these sorts of factors could magnify or even offset one another. And, and then, you know, two related to that, you have very different citizen notions of deservingness uh, when you think about the sorts of investments that we might discuss in this panel. I think this certainly uh, plays out along some of the demographic lines that Bill Fry discussed. Um, you know, where are we going to put our, our, our tax revenue base? Where are we going to invest that? And that kind of gets to the third point, which is that we have scarce resources that, you know, state level pressures, pensions, prisons, education, um, and amid those pressures, how can uh, researchers, 
policy analysts still make the case that, look, there's a serious cost to underinvestment in people in place. Uh, you know, I think that there are uh, very uh, well-situated moral arguments. Um, although I don't attend regularly, I'm still a good Presbyterian. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a moral argument for a lot of this stuff. Uh, but from, from sort of a cost-benefit standpoint, that there are costs to underinvesting, and, and how do we convey that? Um, so I think this last point fits nicely within uh, the, the two breakout session presenters, and I'm going to introduce them both now. Uh, so uh, first, you're going to hear from Erica Greenberg, and she's going to talk broadly about uh, disparities in educational opportunities. Uh, so Erica is a senior research associate in the Center on Labor, Human Services, and Population, and in the Ed Policy Program at Urban. Got a fancy new office I'm looking forward to seeing at some point. Um, <clears throat> So her, her work is spanning early child programs and policies. It includes state pre-K programs, Head Start, uh, subsidized child care, uh, as well as home visiting. Uh, she's also examining uh, inequality in the K through 12 system and the ways that early interventions could, could address uh, some of what we see. Um, so prior to joining Urban, she was an intern in the Department of Education's Office of Planning, Evaluation, and uh, Policy Development. Uh, and I didn't know this, actually. She was a, she was a pre-K teacher in D.C., so uh, you learn something on these panels, right? Um, uh, so actually, you know, looking at some of her current work, uh, I was really interested. Uh, you know, she's done some interesting kind of within-city analyses with co-authors, thinking about the spatial distribution of child care access uh, here in D.C. And, and I guess the point here, and it's one that uh, co-authors and I have been pushing on, is that we think about state-level differences, city-level differences, there's a lot of within-city variation. And so in that work, she was looking at access to different child care access during non-traditional hours, second and third shifts. So I think this actually speaks nicely to space, uh, something that Paul Long's thought a lot, a lot about in his career. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're really happy to hear from Erica. Uh, uh, Erica holds a BA from Yale. Um, she also holds a master's in political science and a PhD in ed, po ed policy from uh, Stanford. So happy to have Erica. Okay, and our second presenter, uh, Paul Long, happy to have Paul uh, all the way from California. He's gonna be discussing uh, urban inequality and the importance of uh, place and space. So Paul's a research professor in the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Uh, Professor Ong has conducted uh, quite a bit of research over the years on the labor market status of minorities and immigrants, uh, displaced high-tech workers. He's thought a lot about spatial mismatch and environmental justice. Um, so following that last theme, he's thinking a lot about the, the intersection of sustainability and equi equity, um, done some great work on the racial wealth gap, and sort of broadly thinking about the role of urban structures on the reproduction of um, inequality. And so I think this... Uh, this work thinking about sustainability and equity is, is quite important. Localities like New Orleans are thinking really hard about green infrastructure, how that can fit with job opportunities at the local level. So I think this is the kind of work we're going to be talking about for the, for the, the foreseeable future. Uh, Paul directs the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge and is a senior editor at the uh, academic journal AAPI Nexus. He's advised a bunch of institutions, including the Census Bureau, uh, the California Department of Social Services, and the state's uh, Department of Employment Development. Uh, Paul holds a master's in urban planning from uh, University of Washington. Um, won't hold it against him that that's the same place as Scott Allard's from. It's fine, you know. Uh, and a PhD in economics from Cal Berkeley. So, you know, really happy to have both of them here. Uh, again, Erica and Paul will, will speak uh, independently for, for 10 minutes each, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll be opening it up for a, a nice discussion. So we'll start off with uh, Erica. Great, thank you Bradley for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Susan and the Peterson and Ford Foundations for the invitation uh, to talk with you today. See if I can master this clicker here. Um, today I'm going to be providing an overview of disparities in educational opportunity, their longer term implications for the US economy, and their shorter term implications for public policy. 
I want to start with a definition here. This is from Duncan and Murnane, um, who focused on access to coordinated, excellent instruction that provides the skills all students will need to thrive in a rapidly changing economy and society. Certainly a definition that aligns very well with the focus of the US 2050 initiative. When we think about disparities in educational opportunity, uh, we're often looking by race and ethnicity, by uh, children's socioeconomic status, uh, by their nativity or the nativity of their parents, uh, by gender, and then given the decentralized uh, nature of our systems of public schooling in the US, um, disparities by geography. We know that uh, state and local education agencies make very different programmatic choices and levels of investment um, in children's all across the educational uh, life course. Um, and so we see uh, disparities in that uh, dimension as well. I wanna start by highlighting the challenges of observation here. So op opportunity is very much a core American value. And we certainly talk a lot about program and intervention access and availability, but opportunity itself is very difficult to observe and to measure with any sort of validity and reliability. And so more often what we talk about are disparities in outcomes. Um, I'm gonna start with disparities in outcomes in the presentation today and then try and get back to this broader notion of educational opportunity. So disparities in educational outcomes are not new, uh, but we do have a sort of bad news, good news story here. This is seminal work by Sean Reardon plotting uh, uh, educational disparities by both birth cohorts starting in the 1940s all the way up to 2000. Um, and what he and many others have found is a substantial decline in the black-white test score gap. The pattern looks very similar for Hispanic white test score gaps. And there's been an overall reduction in the gap by about 40% over this period, largely between the 1950s and the 1980s. And then what we can see is somewhat stalled progress over the last few years. Um, the gaps today are equivalent to between two and five years of learning, um, which is still substantial despite this progress. At the same time, uh, Reardon notes substantial growth in the income-based test score gap of the same magnitude, about 40% over the period. A very recent uh, paper that came out this week from Rakanushek and colleagues finds this trend to be flatter, but it's still the case that socioeconomic disparities are substantially larger than racial and ethnic ones, um, and the disparities we see uh, based on Reardon's findings are between four and eight years of learning. Given that our entire system of K-12 public schools is 13 years long, that gap of four to eight years is simply astounding. Now, where do the disparities come from? We've got very old studies of APGAR scores from literally the moment of birth, um, and we don't de see disparities there uh, of any sort of systemic nature. Uh, but based on developmental assessments, we see uh, systematic differences by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. By the time children are nine months old, we see disparities widening through two years and then again into the preschool years. Um, and then here is continued work from Reardon uh, showing the patterns of these disparities once children enter school. And what you can see is that they bounce around a little bit in kindergarten and first grade, but then these early disparities are largely maintained. That is that as children progress through school, schools more or less preserve uh, on average the disparities that happen before uh, children uh, come in the front door. Um, and we see again a growth of uh, disparities once children enter post-secondary schooling. So what's happening during children's early years to explain these patterns? Well, one way to think about children's early years is one, uh, a time of substantial disparities in educational opportunity. And I just wanna provide some examples here. Among preschool uh, preschool age children, 71% of poor children are read to regularly at home versus 84% of non-poor children, a gap of 13 percentage points. Among all children birth to age five, less than half of poor children experience any regular early care and education versus two thirds of non-poor children. Uh, we know that quality varies substantially across settings so that even some of the poor children who are enrolled in regular early care and education uh, programs are not in the sort of settings we'd hope for them to be, the kind of settings that are um, incredibly enriching and, and prepare them for ses success in kindergarten and beyond. Um, despite all of that, we do have some relatively recent evidence showing that gaps in early childhood experiences and in early school outcomes are narrowing. Um, these studies compare children uh, entering kindergarten in the late 1990s to those entering kindergarten in the early 2010s. Um, and this is a period of increasing investments in public preschool quality, increasing expansion of home visiting programs and other early childhood pro policies that are designed to get children off to a strong start. And so while, while researchers are still puzzling over these patterns, it's worth noting that we have made some progress despite the substantial disparities that remain. 
So what then can schools and other institutions do about disparities in educational opportunity and in outcomes? Can schools reverse early disparities? Can schools hold inequality at bay? Can schools perpetuate broader inequities? Again, given our decentralized system of public schooling, individual schools certainly do all of these things. Um, and on average, they do the middle one, which I think is often lost uh, in public policy and, and academic debates. On average, schools are holding inequality at bay that's arisen uh, in children's early years. Um, if, though, we wanted to uh, have schools reverse early disparities, what would it take? Uh, we know that there are disparate levels of funding across geographies. We know that there are in an uneven distributions of teacher experience and qualifications. Um, we know that even within the same public preschool programs, uh, children experience very different quality based on their background, uh, income, and racial characteristics. It's important to note in addition, that disparities persist because of forces well beyond education. So families are children's first teachers, and we know that families have substantially different levels of resources and in time to invest in their young children. Uh, we know that communities are certainly a home uh, of opportunity and that there is massive variation in opportunity across uh, communities, uh, given seminal work by Raj Chetty and many others. Uh, we know that there are disparate child policies, safety net programs, and tax provisions um, leading to very different supports for children that allow them to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of them. And so it's really important not to look within schools and education systems, but at these broader social safety net um, and other economic policies as well. When we think about the in implications of these disparities in opportunity and in outcomes, uh, they really are straightforward. Uh, they include lost human capital, growing in economic inequality, and threats to global competitiveness. So what can we do? Uh, well, we can increase our investments in evidence-based initiatives, and we can revisit our investments in uh, initiatives that may be shown to be less effective uh, or less cost-effective. For young children, that means looking at evidence-based home visiting programs that support families um, right uh, within uh, the end of the maternity period and into children's early years. Uh, we can think about increasing investments in higher quality early learning programs. Uh, and our paper for the US 2050 initiative found that these uh, programs like state pre-kindergarten and Head Start are closing historic gaps in access between children of immigrants and children of US born parents. And these programs can be especially beneficial for immigrant families. Uh, within the system of K-12 schools and colleges and universities, there are wide bodies of literature uh, dem uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of various programs. Uh, you can think about extended learning time initiatives, intensive coaching for teachers, uh, and other high-quality professional development supports, um, uh, continued uh, support for children uh, through transitions uh, into and through college. Um, and then here's a point uh, from my colleague, Constance Lindsay, um, on teacher diversity. So we know that a diverse teaching workforce is critical both for children of color and for white children. And here are some evidence showing colleges and universities that are beating the odds in terms of recruiting and preparing a diverse teaching workforce. Uh, we know that health, housing, and income supports like the earned income tax credit or uh, stable affordable housing can be very important uh, for children's uh, educational opportunity and their longer term trajectories. And we know that unfortunately, not every uh, policy solution has a substantial evidence base behind it yet. So policy innovation paired with evaluation is really important for addressing some of these challenges. How will we know if policies are working? I want to return again to Duncan and Murnane. The long-term measure of success will be the educational attainments and earnings of adults who grew up in low-income families and the restoration of intergenerational mobility, which brings us back to the theme of today. The US 2050 Project's goal is to foster a clearer vision of America's future and to spur a sense of urgency to address pressing policy problems, thereby laying the groundwork for future outcomes. Uh, the US 2050 initiative commissioned an impressive set of 10 papers with bearing on educational opportunity, and we look forward to getting into them during the question and answer period. Uh, but for now, I hope I've convinced you that disparities in children's educational opportunity are a pressing policy concern, and that we can all play a role in laying the groundwork for better outcomes. Thank you. OK, good morning. Right, you guys are a little bit awake. <laughs> I'm still on West Coast time, and I have no intention of adjusting my clock to the East Coast. Uh, so what I want to talk about uh, is the mechanism, some of the mechanisms that create inequality. What 
we share in common our, the normative positions, what ought to be done, what should be done. We actually know a lot of the actions we need to take. But to have effective social change, we need to understand you know, what produces inequality. And it's complex. You've heard that uh, this morning, and you'll hear it throughout the day. And I just want to focus on one aspect of that complex mechanism, and that's the role of cities, urban, metropolitan, and regional areas. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, but essentially there, it's where population is concentrated in terms of residence, activities, production, and so forth. And there are two levels that we could think about if we think about cities, and we use the term cities. Uh, the role of inequality among cities. Uh, there's a growing literature and concern that we, uh, geographical mobility is no longer equalizing the economy as a whole. We have uh, regions such as the Silicon Valley, but we have also regions such as around Detroit. And what used to be a mechanism that tied the economy together, the national economy together in terms of mobility, is becoming less and less forceful. So we're seeing growing inequality among cities. There's also the role of the internal urban structure in producing inequality, and I'm focusing on that part. So inequality in the city, uh, we can think about one of two ways. One is inequality in the city. That is, inequality has a stage, it has to be played out. In some ways, the city doesn't matter because it has to be a stage. Think about plays that occur on Broadway, New York, and gets transferred to Los Angeles to a theater. In some ways, it's just not a stage. It's the action that counts. And quite often, we think about it, the world of cities that way, that there are processes, society processes, that are fundamental, and it just gets played out at a certain place. But I would also argue there is an inequality of cities. That is, there are distinctive mechanisms about cities that plays a role in the production of inequality. And one way you can think about this is cities is probably one of mankind's greatest artifacts. It's a complex machine that shapes our daily lived experiences. With it, an embedded technology that defines what is possible, what is not. And I get, let me give you an analogy to that in a hot political debate. Um, there is a saying that people kill people, not guns. But one could also argue that the weapons we have available makes how deadly we are. And you can think of cities and people the same way. That certainly we make cities, but cities also makes us. And what I'm particularly concerned about is how the city structure, the urban structure, produces economic stratification. In particular, getting down into the weed of the mechanism, the channels, the causal channels by which this happens. And so there are, th for us, three key elements that define the urban structure. One is place. That's the clustering of people and economic activities. It's a it's produced by a number of factors. Uh, on production side, it's produced by local agglomeration, the desire to have face-to-face -face interaction to lower transaction costs. On the residential side, it has a lot to do with sorting, preferences, ability to pay, and so forth. There's also position of places and activities. That is the relative spatial location of where people live, where people work, places where we have shared resources, places where we have exclusive resources that are locked up to people. And those locations matter. Uh, how many of you guys know Los Angeles? Okay, so would you prefer to live in Manhattan Beach or would you prefer to live in East Los Angeles? <laughs> Maybe it's a personal preference thing, but if you like the beach, it's Manhattan Beach, right? So, it is your access, your positions to natural resources, but also gets played out in the social sphere and the economic sphere. And there are paths. Paths are the material networks that link places and activities. We often talk about social networks, social capital. And social networks, social capitals are embedded in these physical networks. It determines, you know, 
what jobs you have available in the network to reach those jobs or apply for a job. It's both embedded spatially and socially. Uh, the type of roads we have could expose you to certain types of risk, as well as give you opportunities. For, so for us, these are the three ways of thinking about the urban structure and how it may produce inequality. So there's inequality of places. So we talk about uh, segregation and place stratification. I'm well aware also of the debate about spatial integration as a counterpart to that. But there's no question that we still have a high degree of spatial segregation along both class and race lines. We have positions that is unequal geographic access and exposure. Those access could be for jobs, it could be for education. Some of them are created just by the physical distance. Some of them are created by jurisdictional boundaries that forbid you to cross a school district line to a better school. It's not that you can't do it physically. It's that in our society, we have produced boundaries that makes it difficult. And path, unfair ways of uh, navigating the urban area. And I just don't mean having a vehicle, for example, but basic things like uh, whether or not police enforcement forbids you from traveling certain places. And we actually know that affects other sort of outcomes in our work. Uh, I'm going to be shamelessly doing a little marketing. So our work is embedded in a forthcoming book uh, from Cambridge uh, in May. But the reason I put that up is that is actually in, it sort of summarizes and synthesizes decades of work that we've done in Los Angeles with my colleagues and friends. And there we looked at the Los Angeles stories, the details about the uh, production of inequality. And so we've seen the production of uh, wealth through the housing market, through both cumulative historical processes, lying with, for example, redlining, as well as contemporary predatory lending and the foreclosure crisis and how that got played out in Los Angeles. Uh, another chapter looks at the production, uh, the in inequality in income through the labor market. And our particular contribution is the transportation aspect, aspect to spatial mismatch. In Los Angeles, actually, if you do the standard spatial mismatch indicators, Low-income areas are not that more mismatched. Matter of fact, in some areas, are better spatially accessible to jobs than Bel Air. Okay, you guys know Bel Air? You know, Prince of Bel Air? <laughs> okay, you know, it's, it's, it's a privileged place. And they have no accessibility to jobs, but they don't want accessibility to jobs. They don't want jobs nearby. You know, they like their pristine hills. Um, so it's not just spatial in terms of distance. It's also the ability to overcome that space. And that's the transportational part of it. And then finally, the reproduction of educational equality through, in Los Angeles, this incredibly fragmented system. Fragmented in terms of the private public sector. We have a pretty robust private school system. But that system is also divided in terms of the sector that's mainly uh, religious-based, which serves a lower income, but have far fewer resources, and the privileged high schools and elementary schools, which you guys kind of heard a little bit about in the scandal now, or admissions, you know, those are the schools. Uh, and that contributes not only to education, but as many said before, uh, the intergenerational transfer of inequality. So to, to, can we generalize from this? Yes, I argue, yes, we can generalize from Los Angeles, although Los Angeles is unique. There's no question Los Angeles is unique. And some people say it's just crazy. You know, it's not America. Uh, but in some ways, it is sadly America in terms of some of its tragedies. And there, the question is that as we head into the future, where are we? If we're concerned about the city as a mechanism of a production of inequality, I think we should think about the cities are right now in the midst of restructuring and transformation. It is responding to climate change and environmental challenge. It could do it proactively or reactively. There's a technological revolution that's been going on and will continue in terms of communication, transportation, production. There are macroeconomic trends in terms of uh, inequality, in terms of income and wealth, globalization and isolation. And there are the demographic recompositions that we're facing. But as one wise 
politician said from Boston, all politics is local. And that, if you understand the mechanism at the local level that produce it, I think we're in a much better position to think about the solutions and how we implement it. And I'm hopeful that we will make progress, but that's not a given. We can only do that both through deep knowledge and a will to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so I'm going to take a, a moderator privilege here and then ask the uh, first question, but then quickly open it up. Uh, you know, look, many of us here are not really into policy implementation at the street level per se, but um, you know, I was struck when Erica talked about kind of the, the effectiveness of home visits potentially. And part of the reason why is that we're talking about improving educational outcomes, but that then brings resources to families within neighborhoods and perhaps neighborhoods that are isolated from some other amenities. And it's kind of an interesting bridge. I guess bottom line, given what many of us see with respect to sorting, um, whether they're sorting and where kids are landing with respect to K through 12 schools, sorting with respect to where families are deciding to live. What might be one, uh, you know, thing, implementation, one uh, program that each of you might like to see tried? Again, with the usual caveats that we don't know if it would work, uh, we're not sure if it would be effective, but I just thought I'd throw that out to each of you. Yeah, I, I, I think there are a variety of uh, promising policy areas, but one that I have uh, encountered more recently is the Promotoris model, um, where there are almost um, sort of buddies or navigators who can accompany low-income families to understanding about the variety of uh, social services that might be available to them, um, the job training programs or other educational opportunities that might be available to them, helping them to learn and to navigate about all of the childcare and early education programs um, that can quite honestly be very confusing because there are so many different options, helping them to understand what are the best ones for them, how they're gonna be able to, uh, to make uh, good use of them every day, Sure. It's continued attendance. Um, and so that kind of model, I think, scaled uh, in, in many communities could be of great help. Well, no. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, maybe I take a slightly different cut. So I appreciate all the work that you and other people here in Washington, D.C. do. And that is in trying to advocate for policies. We probably know far more effective policies than we've been able to get adopted and implemented. So let me just say that my small efforts to work in the real world has not been very fruitful. And it's been very challenging. So we just completed one study for the state and one of the things we looked at, one of the measures in sustainability as we move forward is looking at where affordable housing is located relative to a number of indicators. And one is what's called a jobs housing mismatch, uh, which is essentially those neighborhoods that have lots of low wage jobs, but very few affordable units. And so we documented that that's a problem, but we documented that recent developments, new, ho new affordable housing, is not going there. Uh, as soon as we uh, turned on our report in December, we heard that there was massive pushback by one of the departments who did not like the results and would bury it. Uh, and, and it's still go we're still trying to resolve this in a diplomatic wording so they don't feel like they're being bashed. And we never tend to bash them. I mean, I'm a researcher. I just want to monitor what's going on. Uh, it's so it's challenging. You know, we have good ideas, but how do you get it and act it? Uh, we're currently working with uh, the council district in South Los Angeles. And so South Los Angeles, uh, traditional home of African-Americans, but there's been a decline both in absolute and relative numbers of African-Americans in Los Angeles, particularly South Los Angeles. And the council member is very concerned about that. And it, it's being accelerated by gentrification of all the zip codes in Los Angeles. Three zip codes in South Los Angeles are among the top five in terms of escalation, in terms of housing prices. It's, a, it's so amazing what's driving these sort of changes. Uh, transit's coming in. 
which is a great thing in some ways. But our work also on transit-oriented development means that it could trip in terms of displacement. And so trying to figure out, we actually know the solution, but trying to figure out how to get it enacted. And then even more importantly, if you enact it, make sure it's implemented and monitoring that. I think we have a role doing that. But again, I applaud people who do this on a daily basis. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, so, you know, I want to open it up to the uh, the audience and, and maybe even quickly give some preference to uh, the 2050 authors who, who are in the audience. Uh, and so I want to open it up. Now, people who know me know I can talk and I have a bunch of questions here, but uh, I want to share at least. So, uh, okay, I, I saw uh, Danny uh, Schneider here. Yeah. Danny Schneider from UC Berkeley. I have a question for Erica. First of all, that was a really wonderful presentation of what I know to be a super complicated literature. I try every year to teach it to my undergraduates. I'm taking notes. This was a really effective presentation. Here's my question, is when we look at that time trend, you showed us in the achievement gap, but when we look at the gaps in sort of parental investment in kids, we see those really increasing sharply by class with the, real, with the top shares, with the top 10% really pulling away, making these extraordinary investments. I mean, sometimes cheating on the SAT, but more often, you know, violin lessons and uh, high quality daycare and all the rest. You know, when we think about what to do about it, is the solution to raise the floor through public policies, or is there a kind of culture shift, uh, I don't know, public campaign to get these rich people, like many people in this room, to stop it? <laughs> <laughs> to stop these per inequality and intergenerational mobility uh, uh, well, uh, inequality uh, reducing and, and intergenerational mobility reducing, or inequality enhancing, sorry, things to, to stop doing that. And is there any hope of that, or can we really rely on raising the floor to do the job? Uh, it's a great question. I think it's a, it's a both and answer. Uh, I don't have any particularly uh, illuminating ideas on how to get families to stop it, because uh, we've got this uh, burgeoning market of uh, children's lessons and goods and all these sorts of things, and, and so demand will, will create more of that. Um, but there is new work from uh, Margo Jackson at Brown and, and others looking at um, differences in public investments across states, and very preliminary findings suggest that um, in the higher spending states, we see narrowing disparities in parents' expenditures, so that if there are uh, rich libraries and uh, parks and recreation programs and other things, then there's just less for rich parents to spend on. Um, and so that's sort of promising to my mind that, um, that at least we can sort of work in the public policy sphere and try to address these issues. That's a great question, yeah. Uh, hi, just allow me, because I just read an article about that Recently, I'm an economist, Eva de Francisco from the Fed, uh, the Board of Governors, and the article made a point of comparing inequality in advanced countries in Europe and the U.S. And he said that because in U.S. there's so much inequality compared to other countries, parents freak out, thinking you know that their kids need to be in the top one percent, so they go crazy about you know, paying for all these extra classes and so on, versus in other countries, you feel your kid is just not going to a top school, but it's gonna be okay anyways, because it's not so unequal. Then you're more relaxed, you lay back, and you let your kid have more of a kid uh, grown, grown up. So I just, I thought it was interesting. It was in the Washington Post, but. So my question was for Erica too. As a mother of three children in elementary school <laughs> right now, um, I'm, um i you know i wanted to 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 hear from you that had has experience in in the us uh, educational system but um i i read that in other countries we teach children how to read and math later on versus here the first time i took my kids to kindergarten you know the, in a very good public school mm -hmm. the the principal said uh, <coughs> Kindergarten is the new first grade, and my 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 question was like, why my kids are still five? You know, they're not six, they're not mature. What are you going to bombard them with academics uh, and place just their value in academics? You know, there's no. 
uh, that much recess time. There's no PE twice or three times a week. Um, why are we so focused on academics? This is also bad for parents that don't have time, that don't have resources. You know, you see that kids come in with, with some differences, but if your mom and your dad is not there to read you, to help you do the homework, my kids get homework, they don't know how to do it. They need me help them. So if I'm working all the time, of course the disparity is gonna continue through time. How about if your kid doesn't have a quiet place? and is six or seven, he or she cannot go to the library, the public library, if you're lucky to have a public library. Like, I think the, the fact that we just tried, and I'm an economist, so I, I, I value measurement. I know that's how you measure if your kids are doing well, you know. But uh, I think a lot of the focus on early education is in academics when it should be on, you know, let's learn about yourself, you know, what's important sure, for you, how you relate to others, how you make friends. And, uh, and, and you go later on, and, and American kids tested pretty poorly compared to other, um, you know, advanced economies. So, um, up to, I mean, I just think as we're just putting the, the resources, you know, in the wrong places, <coughs> instead of just thinking a little bit more about um, what matters for us. Um, and Eva, I want to give, uh, you know, folks a chance to respond yes, to sorry. So I appreciate <laughs> Thank that. you. Yeah. Great. Um, so our co-authors have, have a paper called Kindergarten is the New First Grade. Um, and it's true in, in terms of expectations and time use of parents and teachers um, from the uh, late 1990s to the early 2010s. There has been this massive shift towards um, academic preparation um, and academic performance. Um, and largely the explanation for that was the uh, federal accountability law that came in in the early 2000s that sort of filtered all the way down into kindergarten and, and even into the early childhood years um, and reshaped how schools were structuring their uh, curriculum and, and uh, sequencing of lessons and all this sort of thing. Um, that law has changed, and so there's the opportunity to scale back a little bit. Um, but there's what I think of as very promising research that just came out in the last few months um, that a highly... Uh, sort of literacy and early math focused uh, kindergarten experience or early childhood experience doesn't have to preclude uh, a focus on joy of learning, a focus on social emotional development, approaches to learning, um, an allowance for children to develop literacy skills at their own pace with proper supports. Um, so I think often there's this sort of dichotomy and, and folks are focusing on the debate of it's either uh, play or it's academic rigor. And, and we're seeing, at least from some preliminary studies, that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, and I hope that uh, the programs and, and teacher preparation programs that get at that intersection are, are proliferated. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. One part of this recent uh, scandal has, in part, opened up a broader discussion about, really, in many respects, uh, the very strong educational system we have in the United States that that, that is outside of some of these schools. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, research being generated at uh, state schools, uh, regional schools, and, and the like, and, and the perception and reality gap that we see with respect to how parents uh, perceive a lot of opportunities that are, you know, right down the road. Uh, Marcus Casey. Oh, yeah. Hey, Hareen oh. Contractor Joint Center. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks, Marcus. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, the survey we did for US 2050 about uh, future work, uh, training sentiments, we found overwhelmingly, regardless of income and education level, Asian Americans, Latinos, and African Americans want additional state support or federal support for training, educational support. It was whites that were overwhelmingly did not want anything uh, have to do with additional support from the government. Um, one, looking at those issues, do you think dem you know demographics might be destiny in terms of changing some of these policies? And then two, on the flip side, what do you think about different technological advances to break through some of these, whether it's blended learning, blockchain, big data, to kind of break through some of the barriers we've seen currently? <laughs> um. I, big data, okay, I, I don't know about the first, but big data, I'm both intrigued but fearful of big data. Uh, one of my students has been doing work on AI and machine learning and so forth, and it produces some new insights. It also produces a lot of garbage, in my opinion, uh, that I fully don't understand the, the output, so we go through the output. Uh, 
I think it's going to take a long time for us to figure out uh, how to deal with the inherent biases in big data, the inherent limitations, uh, the, your ability or lack of ability to link it to other factors if you want to do the modeling and so forth to understand what's happening. That's, those are huge challenges. Now, I think we can make progress. My biggest reservation is that we may make progress methodologically but and that may give us greater insight in terms of the nature of the problem. Uh, I'm not sure how much it gives us insight in terms of how to move forward in terms of having change and so forth. Um, I, I did want to make one uh, statement for the last previous two questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, one of the things we looked at that in, in terms of educational quality was actually the amount of money that goes through organizations as PTAs. At least in Los Angeles, if you take the top-ranked elementary schools versus the lowest one, the difference is enormous. Um, and actually, if you look at it as a total budget, it approaches you know, one-tenth, one-fifth of the budget in terms of what happens on the margin. And there hasn't been much research on that set of uh, resources that are going into our educational system that's making disparities on top of disparities. That's a nice point. I mean, one thing I'd, I'd throw out just to kind of complicate matters, some interesting uh, work from Jesse Rothstein that was funded by uh, Center for Equitable Growth, and he more or less, you know, shows that looking at the kind of geographic difference in social mobility, when they start to look at the role of K through 12 educational investments, it's not that it doesn't mean anything, but in fact, uh, much of the explanation for mobility is not necessarily the K through 12 investment. And he's thinking about uh, labor markets, social interactions, uh, marriage markets. And so it just means that there's a bunch of different things going on here. And I think a lot of us are comfortable talking about the educational investments, labor economists, I'm one of them, but thinking about how to factor in a whole bunch of other things that are gonna load up, so. Yeah, um, I actually have a comment slash question for both of you, but it's actually related. So the first one, um, I'm Marcus Casey from the Brookings Institution. Um, for Erica, you know, the one thing that hasn't, that doesn't really get talked about a lot that I would love to see more research on um, as an urban economist is not so much cross city or cross neighborhood um, differences, but sort of within city dynamics with respect to the latter or cross schools. And so the reason why I think about that is that, that and this sort of relates to the comment I, I wanted you, or a question I have for you, Paul, was this issue of sort of the local political economy and how that relates to things. So I think one of the problems, you know, so I, I, I just recently moved to DC and I spent a lot of time talking to, uh, my kids go to one of the quote unquote best elementary schools in the city. But when I talk to a lot of the parents, you know, there's a lot of resistance to them actually supporting additional investments in the local middle school and local high schools because they desire to only invest in people who actually live in the neighborhood, so this local social interaction effect. And so what I'm interested in is sort of thinking about, uh, you know, sort of the dynamics of those sorts of investment desires, changing people's beliefs that not only is the elementary school important, but also the f future investments in, in, in potentially, you know, sort of incentivizing people to stay in. And sort of related to that, Paul, is this question of, you know, demographic change. I guess as somebody who actually studies uh, neighborhood transition, neighborhood change, one of the things that I found interesting is as neighborhoods begin to change, there's, there's, a, there's a distinct uh, difference in, in what people view our priorities. And I guess one of the fundamental problems going forward as the neighborhoods continue to change in the way that you've described in LA, Chicago, other places, DC, is you know these issues of segregation and so on and so forth aren't just from from you know, maybe not in this room, but when I talk to people, <laughs> you know, and I actually do ethnographic research, which is weird for an economist, my own personal, <laughs> because I like to hear what people are saying, you know. They don't view those things as priorities. So how do you get those people to care about these issues if the people who, you know, 
view it as a first and foremost issue are leaving the neighborhoods. I know there's some hard questions, yeah. but I, I, I wanted to talk to the conversation about it. Any responses? Sure. I mean, I think we have national data showing the increase in residential segregation. It's something that public education and all other social service systems are, are grappling with. Um, well, can I push back? Actually, a lot of, you know, so, so I've gone to enough conferences where they talk about things like, oh, residential segregation is actually declining, right? And so, you know, so then, you know, when you look at sort of the national data and then you see what's happening in local neighborhoods, part of the problem is we have an ecological issue. Yeah, I think that's right. And it ties into your broader points about local education systems, um, particularly in, in the District of Columbia and in many others where there is incredible choice um, not tied to residential location, either through charter schools or voucher programs or private schools. Um, and so it's it, it really takes a lot of investments and supports uh, to buck the trend of inequality that is you know, reinforcing itself through these choice systems. So parental information and, and supports for applications and, um, and sort of investigation of of school quality beyond the metrics that we see uh, so easily um, in elementary school and then all the way through, um, I think, are really important. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I think the data does show residential segregation along race lines been declining, but we still got a long ways to go. But also other research on school in terms of ch uh, students, uh, there's been a resegregation. Um, the Civil Rights Project um, certainly has been trying to document that. Uh, I think what is, from my perspective, I think about is again, how we structure cities. And in Los Angeles, we have something like almost 80 school districts. If you follow the history of uh, the civil rights movement in terms of implementing uh, Brown versus Board of Education, what you see is the political use of jurisdictions to reinvent segregation. And so what we've seen in Los Angeles is from the 60s forward is that there's a retreat and instrumental use of school districts, particularly the smaller one, Manhattan uh, Beach has its own school district. All, all up and down the coast, our coastal area, there's all these unique, high achieving, wealthy, uh, predominantly non-Hispanic white. Uh, school districts, and those are school dis those boundaries have been appropriated to reinvent the way we sort of uh, align educational opportunities. Uh, we also see, and you brought up charter schools and some alternative. We, we have also seen that in Los Angeles, that uh, these specialized schools offer promises, but they quite often reinvent the inequalities. So our charter school quite often creams. And although it's supposed to be open to the whole school district, when you look at the actual attendance pattern, it isn't. There are small mechanisms in terms of who's in and who's out. Uh, it's supposed to be fair. I hope it's fair. I don't believe it's necessary, fair in implementation. We see magnet schools also reinventing. So we, we have solutions that have promise. Charter school giving parents control. Magnet school giving specialized education for training without regards to who you are and opening it to the district as a whole. But if you look at, at least in Los Angeles, the pattern of how this evolved, you see constantly the forces of reintroduction of inequality. And it's a struggle. I'm not saying all charter schools are that way, but on the average, they are. They're segregated. Um, they also cream, which has implications in terms of who's left behind. We see the school district boundaries where you, know, you, you may be actually physically closer to a better elementary school, but you can't attend. And there's severe punishments for doing that. Uh, I've got one of the articles that I've seen following the scandal is that, you know, one parent got put in jail, whereas we're not sure whether these parents that pay half a million dollars more are actually ever going to go in jail. You know, the way we enforce this structure, this urban structure to reproduce inequality is in some ways frightening. I'm not saying it's impenetrable, but getting to your point, how do we convince people to change things? 
And it's hard because I understand parents are concerned about their own kids. Um, and they'll do what it takes to do it. Uh, I'm astonished, next to UCLA, we're in a very wealthy area. We're in what's called the platinum triangle of real estate. There's a, one of the best elementary public schools there. You know, it's the school that Hill Hefner sent his two kids to. It's um, Gene Simmons sent his kid to, you know, uh, from KISS, for those of you uh, But they had appropriated that school and segregated it. They have also been one of the biggest generator of PTA funds. And I also know that even despite the school district saying that you have to reappropriate some of that and redistribute it, they have done new channels of parents club to keep it in that school. So it's how do you convince people that this is wrong, particularly parents? Because I understand parents are concerned about their own kids. And I think it has to be a discussion about our shared destiny, our shared broader values. At the same time, acknowledging that you know we are deeply embedded in furthering our own kids' well-being. That's a reality, and that's the hard one for me to really deal with when I go out and talk to parents about these sort of things. Sure, you know, and so we, we're we're just about out of time, but I do want to maybe allow for two maybe comments, right? So so uh, I first had the gentleman behind Marcus, and then I had Mar Margaret Sims. If you could maybe offer your, your comment slash question, and we can at least hear it for the record and discuss it throughout the afternoon, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Noel Kriakos, uh, University of Maryland College of Education. Um, can you comment on the tension between the growing diversity in schools versus, from a policy perspective, imposing either standards or a common standard or a common framework? You know, who's, you know, which dominant culture do you pick in order to, to impose a standard or framework? And then I want to go immediately to Margaret, if you could offer up your, your comment and question. Um, I guess mine builds a little bit on what Marcus was saying, but also um, where Paul ended his remarks um, in talking about South Los Angeles. And that is when we think about um, policies implemented at the local level, how do we deal with the dynamics of those <coughs> communities? So if you have a program that is place-based or place-linked, but the place changes, and the people who need the services are either pushed out or voluntarily leave and go somewhere else. How do we ensure that the the services, the policy um, fixes, follow the people? Two minutes, if we can have some quick responses. I know it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I think maybe joining both questions, we've done some qualitative work, uh, Gina Adams and others, on uh, preschool participation among children of immigrants. It's what led to our US 2050 paper. Um, and so we visited school districts around the country that were beating the odds in terms of uh, attracting and retaining uh, young families who enrolled their children in preschool programs. Um, and we looked at American Community Survey data. We found places we thought would be promising, and we went there. And, and lo and behold, they really were. They had recruited uh, members of the teaching workforce and family support workers from immigrant communities. Um, they had waivers for um, and flexible supports for developing teaching credentials or those that were required to meet standards. They had uh, bilingual programming. They had um, posters and educational materials and languages from all around the world. Um, and so when you think about you know, imposing a dominant uh, curriculum or, or a common set of standards, I mean, that's not how our system of public schooling is set up. It's set up to be majority local or at least state uh, funded and, and directed. Um, and so it was just sort of extraordinary to see these places that were um, including, uh, and not, not just being responsive to, but being led by uh, members of immigrant communities and developing the early learning systems for their children. Uh, one of the biggest challenge, I, I, we want to make places better. We particularly want places that are on the margins better. Uh, there's a huge research that shows around uh, the topic of gentrification by neighborhoods broadly that when you make those sort of investments that make places better, it becomes more attractive. And real estate uh, ins uh, people come in and take advantage of that, what we call you know, the, the rent gap in terms of what's being paid and what's potential. And so that quite often leads to displacement. 
So we ha you're right, we have this tension if we want place-based policies, and I advocate that as part of the solution. How do we make sure that the benefits are generated from place-based policies and in intervention you benefit those stakeholders who should benefit rather than precipitating neighborhood change that leads to gentrification displacement. Uh, and the answer is that uh, we, what we've been telling local agencies is it's not good enough to pour money in. For example, pour money in terms of better rail transit, pour money in terms of infrastructure. You are responsible for tripping changes beyond that investment, and you have to own that responsibility. That is, if you're going to invest that makes real estate uh, more desirable, think about affordable housing and the people who will be displaced because of rent. And we're making a little bit of progress there. So our metro uh, rail system now has affordable housing funds that make first priority for excess land around that area for affordable housing. So it's a battle, but it's one that we have to do because we understand the dynamics yeah. of neighborhood change. Yeah. Now, Paul, thank you for that. And, and so much to talk about uh, maybe during the lunch break and throughout the afternoon. But for now, I just want to thank Erica and Paul for great uh, discussion and presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you both.